All right, here we go. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to the JuntoCast, a podcast presented by the bloggers at earlyamericanists.com. I'm Ken Owen, an assistant professor of colonial and revolutionary American history at the University of Illinois Springfield. And today on the podcast, we're going to be doing our second episode that focuses on a classic work in the field of early American history. We're going to be discussing Edmund Morgan's book, American Slavery, American Freedom. And to join me in that task, I'm joined by two other Junto bloggers. Michael Hattam is a PhD candidate and teaching fellow at Yale University. Thanks for joining us, Michael. Hello, Ken. And I'm also joined by Roy Rogers, who is a PhD candidate at the Cooney Graduate Centre and a writing fellow at the New York City College of Technology. Thanks for being here, Roy. Howdy, Ken. Before we start our discussion of American slavery, American freedom, we've got a couple of announcements to make. Firstly, we've got a brand new website, www.thejuntocast.com, where you'll be able to find our past episodes and links to the further reading suggestions that we've compiled on each episode's topic. And we'd also like to request some feedback on the podcast. Which episodes have you enjoyed the most? What topics would you like to see us cover in the future? And how have you used the Junto cast? Has it just been for your own enjoyment? Has it been for research, for teaching? If you can give us some sense of how you've used the podcast, that would be incredibly helpful to us as well. And to get in contact with us, you can email us at thejuntoblog at gmail.com. And as ever, we'd be really grateful if you could stop by iTunes, search for the Junto cast, and leave a rating and a review of the podcast. And finally, by way of announcements, we recently appeared on Liz Kovart's podcast, Ben Franklin's World, where Michael, Roy, and myself discussed a range of issues, including history blogging, history podcasting, early American history reading suggestions, and a more in-depth discussion of our own work. If you'd like to hear the episode, go to benfranklinsworld.com. Today is going to be the second JuntoCast episode dedicated to a single book in the field of early American history. The first episode we did on this theme was on Bernard Balin's Ideological Origins of the American Revolution, and we'd recommend that you check that episode out after you've listened to this one. But today we're discussing Edmund Morgan's American Slavery, American Freedom. And many of the bloggers at the Junto all three of us included, have already written much about Morgan's work, including a roundtable discussion of several of his most important books. So we're going to give you a brief overview of Morgan's life and work right now, but we're going to post links on our website to the roundtable and other pieces that people have written at the Junto to help you explore his broader contributions to the field of early American history. And to help kick us off in our discussion today, I know Michael's got a few words to say about the life and works of Edmund Morgan. Right. Thanks, Ken. Well, Edmund Morgan was a professor of history at Yale University for well over 30 years. And in that time, he produced a body of work that I think you could argue is close to unrivaled by any other 20th century American historian. He began his career at Brown, producing groundbreaking work on the Puritans, and then moved into the American Revolution, where he once again produced paradigm-shifting work on imperial resistance. Uh, Indeed, his work in the 1940s and 1950s has had a significant impact, I think, on the way the revolution is currently understood in popular or non-academic culture. And in the late 1960s and early 1970s, Morgan again shifted his focus, this time to Virginia and the 17th century, producing a number of articles outlining uh, his ideas. And American Slavery, American Freedom was published in 1975 and is effectively uh, the product of those articles and ideas. In it, 
Morgan contended that the central paradox of American history was that the revolutionaries who were so dedicated to liberty maintained a system of labor that required the denial of liberty. How could a situation like that even come about? And it was Morgan's contention in the book that American slavery and American freedom, as it were, emerged in the same place at the same time, but even more importantly, that the development of the two were inextricably linked. That is to say, each depended on the other. And so Morgan turned to the histories of class, politics, and culture to find the origins of race, racism, and liberty in America in the earliest decades of its settlement. In the end, arguing that those origins had a profound effect on the American Revolution, the development of the Republic, and in effect, uh, the history of the United States down to the present day. And as you mentioned there, Michael, the book is published in 1975, which is obviously at a rather key and controversial juncture in American history. Uh, Roy, I know you had a few words that you wanted to say about the context in which Morgan was writing this book. Right. I think Michael did an excellent job summarizing um, Morgan's life, but we also need to think about what was going on when Morgan was researching and writing this book in the late 1960s and early 1970s. Uh, this was a nadir of American race relations, where after the successes of the civil rights movement in the early to mid 1960s, you've seen after 1968 uh, a lot of urban violence, the assassination of key civil rights leaders and other uh, pro civil rights politicians like Robert Kennedy. You see racism seemingly on the rise rather than on the decline. You see sharp pushback uh, uh, against the, bu the busing movement. And all of these things are sort of pushing this you know, support, person who had supported the civil rights movement in the 1950s and 1960s, like Ed Morgan, uh, a, a very classic Cold War liberal like Ed Morgan, to really look at the origin point of race relations in America, which is, of course, Virginia, who's the first colony in British North America to see significant interactions between African Americans and European Americans. And really, Morgan is not just writing from the historiography of that period, but really is also writing in the political and racial ferment of the late 1960s and early 1970s. I think there's a few things there that are worth really highlighting about the context and the argumentation of the book itself when we're talking about American slavery, American freedom. Um, the first of which is to pick up on Michael's point, which I think is really important, which is that Morgan's previous work has been either on Puritan New England or the American Revolution. And to move to colonial Virginia was quite a big shift in field. But in some ways, that was an argument in itself that too much of the previous work in early American history had been focused either on the ideas of Puritan New England or a largely ideological narrative about the American Revolution. And yet there were two key ideas within American history, that of American slavery and the other of American freedom, and that if we really wanted to understand the interrelationship between these two seemingly self-contradictory ideas, we needed to look at areas where those two ideas coexisted, and therefore moving the focus of study to Virginia was really important. Now, clearly, that was building on a large amount of work that was being done on the history of slavery at this point. I'm thinking here of the work of historians like Winthrop Jordan, John Blassingame, Eugene Genovese. And in doing so, by taking a pretty long view, I mean, this book is a book that starts with the English imagination before settlement in North America and ultimately ends on the eve of the revolution by looking at the way that those two ideas of slavery and freedom coexist and interplay with each other. Morgan produces a book that really does examine more than just ideas, but placing them in a very firmly grounded social context, placing them in a 
pretty sensitively recreated cultural context, whilst also looking at political and economic change in the period as well. And it's for that reason that the book really has been so substantial and has cast such a long shadow in discussions of early American historiography. To give just one example of this, when... At the Junto blog, we ran our first March Madness competition, which created a bracket to allow people to vote on what they thought the best book in early American history was. Morgan wasn't just the winner of the competition, he was the runaway winner of the competition. No other book came close to receiving the popularity of this book. And I think the importance and the imagination of that vision that he had to tackle those big ideas on a somewhat new canvas over such a long period of time is one of the reasons that historians keep coming back to the book and why we're prepared to devote a whole episode of our podcast to discussing its arguments. Right, Ken. And I think it's interesting that in that period when it seems like groundbreaking work on slavery was being produced uh, every year by younger scholars, it, it took a senior scholar like Morgan to produce perhaps the most popular and most synthetic work on slavery in America to that point. And I think that's down to two reasons. The interest of those early scholars of slavery was a bit more atomistic, and that is to say, you know, focused on narrow topics or narrower uh, aspects of topics, and, and that's totally understandable in a relatively new field of inquiry and was extremely fruitful and representative of a broader trend in the field of history around this time anyway. And yet, at the same time, Morgan came from a generation of historians that thought about quote-unquote America as a whole and synthetically. We don't really do that much anymore because it's often seen as too problematic and antithetical to the, the more um, atomistic approach that has come to dominate the field. But American slavery, American freedom – I think, remains a testament to the value and possibility of combining the highly focused work of specialist scholars with a broader perspective and the willingness to attempt to answer really big questions. Let's see if we can move from the larger picture to break this down a little bit more. One of the things that I think is so commendable about the book is that it's written in a tremendously clear structure. It's divided into four separate parts – essentially dealing with colonial origins, then the effects of the tobacco boom, then Bacon's Rebellion, and then the aftermath of Bacon's Rebellion as Virginia develops in the 18th century. And so it's very easy to follow in terms of that structure. I think it's also remarkable insofar as it still is so important for anyone who wants to read about any of the particular events. You have to deal with Morgan. You can't just take out one part of the book and say that's the most relevant. You really, if you're working on early Virginia, you need to be aware of Morgan's work on the labour problem at Jamestown. If you work on tobacco, you need to be aware of his work on the boom. If you work on Bacon's Rebellion, I think it's still the standard account that most people will go to. So let's see if we can get into the detail of the argument a little bit more. Um, he starts off by looking at the genesis of the idea of an English empire. What does he have to say about the idea of the English empire and how this begins to play out once settlers actually reach Jamestown and start trying to set up a colony? For Morgan, uh, the origins of the British Empire sort of have two impulses. The first is an economic impulse, uh, which is to, you know, exploit the resources that these uh, the English settlers would find in, uh, in the New World, very similar to Spain. And the second impulse, and I think the one that's sort of the most dreamy of them all, is the sort of religious impulse. And this is, I think, something that future scholars on the British Atlantic have picked up on, that there, there's, there's sort of this great dream of a, of a Protestant 
empire in the New World as, uh, as an enemy to the Spanish Empire. And a lot of the, of, of the men who were pushing for early settlement for, uh, of, of Virginia, pushing the crown to invest or allow investors to create the, the, the Virginia Company and, and the first colony of Jamestown, were really – they kept coming back to religion as the fundamental – driving force of why the Jamestown project is so important. And while economic arguments and imperial arguments were there as well, what united them, what brought you know this matrix of a variety of different uh, courses towards empire together was this impulse of exporting Protestantism, particularly English Protestantism, the Church of England, into the New World. And of course, what happens uh, once there are, you know, to use a contemporary term, boots on the ground in the Chesapeake, all of this goes, you know, uh, goes into, goes into tra tragedy and farce. On one hand, the minister dies very early on, and that sort of foreshadows how quickly uh, the religious impulse becomes secondary to survival. Right. I, I think the economic and religious impulses behind the earliest efforts of what would eventually become the first British Empire are very important here. But there's also a cultural impulse as well, because in this period, the English are beginning to develop what you could call a sense of cultural superiority in their institutions and in their way of life. Uh, and in some sense, this envelops the economic and religious impulses. And we see the negative impact that this uh, cultural impulse had when the settlers are trying largely unsuccessfully to navigate the exigencies of the first few years of settlement in Virginia, resulting in large-scale death and disease, uh, and is especially evident when Morgan talks about how many of the settlers, particularly those who were gentlemen, refused to work to help grow food even in the face of certain starvation, because that's not what an English gentleman did. Yeah, I I completely agree and I think that one of the things that I really appreciated when I was rereading the first part of the book was that for all that this is a book that's based about the exploration of ideas um, it doesn't allow the ideal to get in the way of the reality because I think a lot of the work of the first couple of chapters is to say yes there is a Protestant empire yes there is an idealism about this and that's really important to note because it's in contrast to the black legend of the Spanish Empire, it's essentially saying that there is something that is inherently more free and inherently more liberty-loving about what the English Protestant Empire will become than other models of New World empires that have been established by Spain and, to some extent, Portugal in the New World. And yet, the minute that you get into the concrete examples, Morgan is making it incredibly clear that none of these high-flying ideals apply at all. That there's a survival impulse, that there's an economic impulse, that there is a cultural superiority and a well, let's be frank, a racist impulse towards dealing with Native Americans that colour all of these previous ideals that said that it was freedom rather than slavery that was what should be, should be moved towards. And so it's already setting up that idea that freedom is undercut by other impulses from a very early stage in the book. And I really like that about the way that Morgan set things up. Right. What what makes this first section so important is it is it it shows that the fundamental question of putting the British Imperial project in a permanent place in Virginia is going to be all of these ideas that the Englishmen have have to be solved through a labor question. Where is the labor that is going to make this work gonna come from? And it because it becomes very clear in the early Jamestown experience that is not going to come from either A, the initial wave of colonists, or B, Native Americans. And the massacre that occurs really makes this clear that there's not going to be the sort of clear dominance of the Native population that the Spanish were 
this is very much flattening out a very complicated historiographical question and evidentiary question, but the sort of dominance that the Spanish were able to achieve for a whole variety of reasons over the native populations due to population density, due to disease in Spanish America, that just wasn't going to happen in British America. So what was the solution to this labor problem going to be? It's not going to be these initial colonists. It's not going to be Native Americans. Well, who's it going to be? And that's what Virginians and uh, white Virginians and authority figures in London and then later authority figures in, you know, proto-Republican Virginia are going to try to puzzle out for the rest of his book. Well, I think that one of the reasons is that, and it's a theme that develops at the very end of book one and then becomes very important when we're talking about Morgan's treatment of the tobacco boom, is that almost every solution that is created ends up having some sort of unintended consequences. That, you know, when John Smith begins to take control and exert military discipline, that begins to lead to some sort of change in terms of the effectiveness of labour, but it also leads to all sorts of built up problems within the power structures, both within the colony and in terms of how London in terms of both the Privy Council and the Virginia Company, view the success or failure of this colony. Yet then they come up with the solution of trying to import more and more servants, because gentlemen don't do work. But that creates all sorts of unintended consequences, both in terms of social structure, but also in terms of the incentives that it provides for the gentlemen who own the labour of these servants to act in a certain way. And so I think that that's what really comes out of this, that there are all sorts of unforeseen problems in terms of establishing this. When we get down to the root of it, the success of the colony is going to be determined on how effectively the British can exert power and whether or not they can turn their land resource in Virginia into a reliable source of profit. That raises all sorts of questions related to politics, towards culture, especially towards labour, and trying to find some sort of stable economy. But it's almost impossible to find a sustainable solution because anything that works in the short term, it's a bit like a game of whack-a-mole. You solve this problem and then a mole pops up somewhere else and you've got to try and deal with that. And I thought that was set up really nicely in this part of the book as well. Yeah, I agree. Morgan really draws out the tenuousness on the ground in these early years of settlement uh, really well. And it's an incredibly trying time, as I mentioned before, disease, starvation, particularly the starving time in the winter of 1609, 1610, conflict with the Native Americans, all plagued these early years. And the settlement was looking very much like a fiscal disaster for the Virginia Company and its investors. That is until something turned it around. Yes, and it's the discovery of tobacco that really provides Virginia with the cash crop that it needs to turn a profit to begin to ease and assuage the fears of the investors in the project back in London. One of the things that I really liked about this, and the reason I mentioned unintended consequences in, in my last bit, was because I think when we look at that period of time in Virginia, there's a tendency, at least within textbook treatments of the development of Virginia, to apply universal stories about the development of America from what goes on in those 10 years. You know, tobacco proves that this was all about American industry, or the development of the headright system proves that this was all about property ownership, and that's what turned things round. Or the House of Burgesses and the creation of an alternative power structure was something that gave the seeds of American democracy, and that allowed things to, to flourish. Or alternatively, the fact that at the same time we have records of African slaves being imported into the colony for the first time proves that it was fundamentally the exploitation of labour. But I think the way that Morgan strings it together is that all of those things run into each other, that it's the creation of a social system 
that ultimately serves to entrench power, not in any deliberate or systematic way by design, only, it only becomes systematic by practice, but nevertheless the development of tobacco provides the spur around which all these other factors that will then become part of the system that leads to this instability that becomes the driving force of the second and third parts of, of Morgan's book. It's that tobacco boom that really provides the thrust and the development of, of that argument. Right. The, the rise of tobacco as a cash crop had all kinds of consequences, as Ken mentioned. It's what effectively created the labor shortage that would come to dominate the story of Virginia for the rest of the century, like, as Roy was talking about before. It would initially lead to uh, labor developments like the growth in indentured servitude, and we'd see the first Africans brought to the colony, initially as servants, not slaves. The first uh, women brought to the colony in any significant numbers. And the headright system of granting land would also result in, in families beginning to, to settle in Jamestown. And so what tobacco does is it really remakes the society and the government, but in ways that were haphazard, at least in the sense that they weren't always pre-planned. And the fact that and this is what I really like about Morgan's book, and is that what makes Virginia the way it is for, for the 16th, excuse me, what makes Virginia the way it is for the 17th and 18th century is the fact that the introduction of tobacco was a boom. And it wasn't so much that development was haphazard because that there were plans. I mean, there were plans on every level of trying to tobacco, develop tobacco logically, to try to, to develop the social institutions in the form of both the House of Burgesses and the Church of England in Virginia, to try to create a sense of, of social stability. That And even the headright system, which was heavily abused uh, by the, the, the growing planter class, there was this plan. But tobacco and the way in which tobacco is grown outpaced the ability of both authorities in Virginia and the ability of authorities in London to shape this society into something that could create stability. So you have a whole variety of different labor systems, social systems, and political systems that develop in Virginia that are in many ways mutually exclusive or they rub up against each other in a way that's going to create clear social conflict going into the third section of his book that we get into sort of Bacon's Rebellion. And that that's the tragedy of Virginia. And I think that's one of the things that connects the second part of his book to the first part of the book is that there are all of these dreams of creating sort of a, a, a New England in Virginia that all go not very far because of the nature of the land of the Chesapeake. And the way that he brings out the venality of the way that people operate is quite remarkable as well. I mean, one of the one of the lines that I enjoyed most in the book was when he was talking about the piracy of Englishmen in the Caribbean in the 16th century. He refers to Francis Drake as a hijacker and a pirate and a criminal, but on the scale that transforms crime into politics. And when you start looking at the way that he portrays the actions of all those that have almost by happenstance found themselves in positions of power within Boontown, Virginia, and the way in which they're trying to get around any sort of trading laws, the way that they are deliberately misusing both the land and the servants that the company has provided for company use, not just for, for personal profit. Um, it is so vividly recounted about how exploitative, how corrupt, how venal so many of these actors are, that it really brought that to, to life in quite an astonishing way, which I thought was particularly effective because, as you say, a lot of the legwork that this stuff is doing with regards to the book's argument is to set up the instability of Bacon's Rebellion. And a lot of those issues really are structural and societal and don't necessarily have to be told with that personal story. 
and yet that boomtown analogy really allows you to bring out just what a lawless place this could be at times. Absolutely. I mean, he describes the venality of the boomtown period that you're talking about with the phrase, quote, the ugliness of private enterprise operating without a check. And I think that sums up his view pretty well. Uh, the labor issue is going to be central as we move forward, especially in the next section on Bacon's Rebellion. But I wonder if we might talk a little bit more specifically about what the labor situation looked like in the decades immediately following settlement, especially for those listeners who maybe haven't yet read the book. Right. There are two, there are two central forms of labor that are growing. Um, one uh, is, of course, indentured servants. Uh, imported uh, from from the British Isles to Virginia for a fixed period of terms, um, where at the uh, uh, you know at the end of say seven years, these uh, in- indentured people would get freedom. With freedom came uh, a certain amount of land, perhaps, or a certain amount of, of material goods given to them by uh, the master. Next to that developed the system of enslaved African Americans, where uh, Virginian planters purchased enslaved African Americans, uh, excuse me, well, enslaved Africans, and some were for African Americans uh, from the from the Caribbean, and uh, you know worked them in the what, when, when we think of plantation slavery in the late 18th and early 19th century, you know, in that sort of. Uh, sense you know uh, they were they were slaves for life at least nominally uh, but in this early period the category of servant uh, white servant and the category of black slave uh, African slave were a lot fuzzier uh, than they were uh, in you know when we traditionally think of slavery uh, there were some servants uh, white servants who never were able to leave the servant status and there were some enslaved African Americans who were able to leave the slave status for free status. And this sort of flexibility uh, of racial statuses, of class statuses, created a whole bunch of problems that feed into to Bacon's Rebellion. Uh, the first is it led to a lot of social and sexual contact. Uh, between Africans and Europeans that was not what the planter elite wanted. It led to uh, a gradual shrinking of the amount of available land uh, where, you know, you have to give land to your new servant uh, and, well, the desirable land on the river is getting eaten up so there's not good desirable land for these former servants so they get worse land and then resent the planters who have the good land. And then finally, there's this problem of where do we go from here? Where I think by the end of the boom, or as the boom is sort of clearly coming to an end, Virginians are wondering who is going to really be in charge by this? Because nominally what's happening is as you give more and more land out to these former servants, they should have more political power. But the planter class, the people who had initially brought over these servants or had imported these enslaved Africans, they are at the same time concentrating more and more wealth in their own hands. So you have a tension between a nominally growing political power among lower class whites and and some former enslaved Africans and growing wealth among a planter class that is increasingly institutionalizing itself. I think it's important that we look at the ways in which those systems slowly develop as well. Because I think the thing that's set up by the way that Morgan talks about the boom is that corruption, is that greed that becomes the centrepiece of society. But as you say, there's a lot of other things that in terms of formal structures are a lot more fluid. And indeed, that's, it's that very fluidity that allows people to be so corrupt and greedy. The thing is that that gives them an institutional power. And... You know, when we're talking about servants in the 1620s, they die. 
Yeah, there is such a huge death rate that actually all of these things that we point to as problems don't exist because, quite simply, people aren't surviving long enough for them to become strong societal problems. It's not until we move later in the century and you start to get to a point where servants are surviving till the end of their indenture, when they are looking for land, that some of these other issues begin to come to a head. And I think the fact that they're shut out of the system is very important. Um, I think there's a couple of other things that we can talk about there. You know, the way that the legal system operates to try and keep them in servitude for longer, to use the punishment of increased servitude to try and deny people freedom. Um, and I think we can also look at something where Morgan is tremendously sensitive in his treatment, which is the actual functioning of the tobacco trade. And the fact that because there hasn't been much of a system, those that had the best spots on the coast have been able to dominate the trade and therefore dominate the best prices that can be received in London, dominate access to what tobacco actually gets transported anywhere else. And so slowly that greedy, corrupt society begins to transform itself in terms of economic coercion in terms of labour exploitation, economic coercion in terms of restricted access to trade, and that that can then become used for exploiting positions within the legal system and the political system on top of that to begin to provide almost this incredibly tight vice that's squeezing the poor in Virginia in all directions with almost nothing as an escape valve. Yeah, all that becomes magnified once the boom ends, right? As you get into the 1630s and 1640s, the tobacco market gets flooded and prices that planters can get for their tobacco uh, become depressed. And even after the initial depression, the price of tobacco continues to fluctuate wildly, creating uh, significant economic instability within the colony. And with that, it, it became that much more important for the emerging planter class to consolidate their control over the poor class of servants and landless whites, as Ken was talking about. And one of the questions that comes up around this period is, uh, why did it take planters so long to move away from indentured servitude uh, to slavery if they indeed had to resort to this kind of venality to maintain control over the servants and freedmen or, or former servants? And, you know, that's due in part to the high mortality rate of servants that, that Roy had talked about before. You don't want to pay outright for slaves if many of them are going to die in a year. And if you bring in servants who die before their seven-year indenture is up, then all the better since you got free labor from them without ever having to give them the land and tools they would have been owed had they completed their indenture. Economic policy also played a role since by uh, – uh, the 1660s, the House of Burgesses had removed duties on trading uh, with the Dutch, who were the primary carriers of slaves to Virginia in this early period. And that made it cheaper to purchase slaves from the Dutch traders. And so the combination of a lower mortality rate among new inhabitants and uh, increased access, as it were, to Dutch slave traders uh, uh, you know, be began to turn the tide away from indentured servitude towards slave labor – uh, as you get uh, a little bit past uh, the middle part of the century. And, and you certainly see a tightening of the legal structures at that point as well, that it's at that point that the term slave becomes used unambiguously in law for the first time. It's in that period in mid-century when servitude, uh, when lifetime servitude is defined as following the condition of the mother, um, thus creating perpetual slavery in a legally enforceable system. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that it didn't exist beforehand. It just means that it's codified and there's much less flexibility within that system. Um, but nevertheless, that's when you start to see things. But the interesting thing for me there is that you know, that cultural change precedes the actual change in the importation of 
slaves into Virginia ahead of servants, which doesn't come until after Bacon's rebellion, which I mention now as a means of trying to get us to talk a little bit more directly about Bacon's rebellion itself, which I think is probably the most famous and the most um, remarked upon part of Morgan's book. So maybe to frame this in terms of questions for you guys, what is the proximate cause of Bacon's Rebellion, and why is it such a critical juncture within not just Virginian history, but colonial American history? Its origin is the disjunction uh, that we've been talking about between the growing ex-servant class and the current servant class and the current slave enslaved population with the interests of the planter class that's trying to get a grip on this colony's politics and its economy uh, much more successfully it's a grip on its economy less so successfully on its grip on politics and Bacon's Rebellion has its origins in on a, the interests of the former servants cl class conflict with Native Americans over land and this group feeling like the planter class doesn't understand that the only way for them to get access to more land to, to grow tobacco is going to be at the expense of Native Americans, while the planter class wants stability in relations with Native Americans. And so we see this blow up over this disjunction that political power is not clearly resting in the interests of the majority of citizens who ironically want war with Native Americans while the minority want uh, the planter elite don't want a war and so it just leads to a complete violent breakdown of Virginia's social order, of Virginia's political order that leads to a very threatening to the planter class alliance between servants, former servants, slaves and former slaves that could, if it reaches more of a boil, completely topple the experiment of Virginia. I think one of the things that's come out of the discussion that we've had in the last few minutes is the extent to which ideas have dropped away from Morgan's story by the time we get to, to Bacon's Rebellion. And I realise that yeah, there are arguments that he advances about Republican ideology and so on within the way that all actors within Bacon's Rebellion are thinking about this. But I think ultimately, if we're looking at the way that he, he constructs this narrative, it's that everyone is looking for some form of stability. The problem is that the stability that the planter class wants is the stability that was founded on tobacco booms, which is of its very nature, unattainable as a stable goal. And that means that that sort of stability can only be achieved by increasing the precariousness of those underneath them within the social structure, which is why they all these different factors that we talk about. You know, they're pushed into closer proximity with Native Americans, they're pushed onto marginal land, they're shut out of trade. You know, now, there are ideas with regards to freedom that undergird all of these things, and I'm not trying to say that Morgan is not aware that the idea of a, a gentlemanly ideal and a life of leisure is why the planters are pursuing the stability that they want. I'm not trying to argue that the idea of a stable yeoman landholding is not one of the ideas that's undergirding what the servant and the ex-servant class are pushing for. But I think the way that we've been telling the story points towards something that's actually very different, um, which is that it's much less ideas and it's much more these structural factors that lead to the tinderbox of Bacon's Rebellion. Now, I realise at this point, Bacon's Rebellion is such a complicated event that it's very difficult to summarise anything <laughs> to do with it in terms of mono, dual, or even tricausal factors. Um, the fact that it's led by Nathaniel Bacon, who has every chance of becoming part of the planter elite, is one factor. Um, the fact that you point out, Roy, the, the, the fact that this is built off a desire 
and a thirst to wage war with Native Americans, despite the political claims to being made by Bacon's rebels, is something else that complicates a lot of the the issues that that comes into this. Um, but I think one of the things I think we might want to think about here is what is that relationship between rhetoric and reality that's been so important in the way that Morgan sets things up? How does that relationship play out in the way that he writes about Bacon's Rebellion? I think what makes Bacon's Rebellion so terrifying and so threatening is, and it's what plays into the final section of uh, Morgan's book about sort of the solution to this problem, is that for the elite planter class, particularly in the figure of someone like um, uh, Berkeley, uh, who was Governor Governor Berkeley at the time, is that it's a Republican nightmare. Because one of the, the central threats to the Republic, going all the way back to classical Republicanism uh, of pe- figures like Machiavelli, is a disenfranchised, largely landless elite that threatens the sort of freedom that the elite have to rule the republic successfully. And that's exactly what someone like uh, Berkeley has in this fermenting rebellion. And the figure of Nathaniel Bacon as this person who was one who could have been part of this elite but doesn't uh, you know fails and is, he's a caesar really in in this in this sort of framework so in many ways this is a classic virginia has fallen into the classical republican trap yeah i think it's important to keep in mind that the rebellion itself it's not necessarily as clear cut as saying it's the planner elite versus the landless uh, because there are some planners who are effectively funding Bacon and his rebels, right? Undoubtedly, it is primarily the story of a social and political rupture between the elite and the lower orders of Virginia society, but there's also a conflict among the planners themselves that was stoked by Governor Barkley and his own actions, uh, particularly his own personally beneficial relationships with the surrounding Native tribes. So it's not just about elites wanting peace with the natives to allow them to focus on tobacco and subduing the lower orders. But the venality and self-interestedness, which Ken talked about before, is still very much playing a role in the conflict that gave rise to Nathaniel Bacon and ultimately a thousand men uh, resisting Governor Berkeley by massacring Native Americans for their land and eventually torching Jamestown to the ground. I, I agree with you there, and I, and I, I would I would go so far as to say you know, I, I think one of the the directions that has been usefully taken up by historians writing about Bacon's rebellion subsequently has been to to look at what the ideology of the rebels was as well that you know in the same way that elite ideology is complicated in the way that morgan explains so is rebel ideology and an example of this i realize i'm promoting my own phd advisor's work here but peter thompson's article in the william and mary quarterly that talks about the role of class in the petitions that's being made um, that are being made in the various counties of virginia as bacon's rebellion is beginning to take hold um, i think are also also point towards this fact that ideology has to be treated very sensitively with regards to Bacon's Rebellion. And in some ways that helps explain the political settlement of Bacon's Rebellion as well, which, you know, while people have, other historians have tried to portray this as some step change in the way that imperial relations were carried out or a step change in the way that um, Virginian politics were carried out. In some ways, it doesn't change a huge amount, at least in terms of structure. Britain isn't able to do too much to control Virginia. Um, In the aftermath of Bacon's Rebellion, the basic political structure remains the same with maybe even more enhanced powers for the planter elites at the expense of a at the expense of a governor and i think one of the things that's coming out of our discussion is that so many of these things are complicated because there isn't this easy narrative in explaining causes or ideology or consequences that we would like to see in a typical event that we that we term a rebellion in in this sort of way and 
Morgan deals with a number of those issues particularly well. With that said, I raised the issue of ideology to move us on into the last part of Morgan's argument, which is where those ideas of slavery and freedom really come back into the narrative, and that's where the overarching argument ultimately gets wrapped up. I think what we probably want to do here is to summarise the argument that Morgan is making in this chapter, um, or this section of the book, um, but then I'd like to get into some criticisms, because I think this is where the book begins to become more controversial historiographically, at least in terms of the arguments that it presents. Um, but let's think about, let, let's go back to what Morgan is arguing specifically. I mean, what is his argument for the aftermath of Bacon's rebellion with regard to the question of slavery and freedom in colonial Virginia? Right, well, in the wake of Bacon's Rebellion, I think one of the main consequences is that you get an elite turn toward legal racial slavery that at the same time effectively improves the situation of the white lower orders of society, if only because now they are not the lowest order of society and cannot uh, become part of the lowest order of society. It begins to become clear to the planner class that it's much better to pit all white Virginians against uh, the slaves rather than to have the landless and small landholding whites in direct primary opposition with the planner elite. And so those reforms were meant to ally the non-elite whites with the planner class and prevent them uh, from allying with the now racially and legally inferior African slaves. I think it's through these legal and political means that they successfully prioritized racial difference over the class difference that had been so problematic for elites to manage throughout the 17th century and that had eventually culminated in the planner class's worst nightmare, which was Bacon's Rebellion. Yes, it links the development of race in Virginia as a clear legal, political, and cultural concept that is crystallized and everyone can point to and say race exists in Virginia with shoring up slave as a clear and distinct legal, political, and social category, uh, and then combining the two to say that if someone is in an un unequal legal status, that person is a slave, and if someone is a slave, they, have, they are of African descent. That after Bacon's Rebellion, these two concepts become pretty permanently linked in the eyes of all European um, Americans in Virginia. You know, and this this argument that slavery becomes fermented and made a permanent feature of Virginia's life uh, is sharply contested. Uh, many, many future historians come down on, don't see this as happening in Bacon's Rebellion. Some see it as happening much earlier. Some see it as happening later. That, you know, this moment of Bacon, this moment of crisis in Bacon's Rebellion is overblown uh, um, with Morgan, that it's too easy of a pivot. Uh, but no one has entirely toppled it, though. It, it, this remains sort of, you know, this, while this is the most contested part of Morgan's book, it is still, despite the criticism, this thesis that slavery comes out as a permanent feature of Virginia's political, legal, and uh, economic culture and society, seeing Bacon's Rebellion as the pivot of that, it just, it's still there. It's still, that's a valid interpretation to take. Right. Uh, he makes the tie to Republican ideology in the sense that once you have not just marginalized Africans and slaves, but done so to such an extent that they are now uh, set apart from or are outside of civil society, and in a way that allies the planter class with the non-elite whites, then planters can argue that any actions they're taking are serving the entire public good because Africans and slaves are not part of that equation. Planners can still do things that uh, economically and legislatively uh, benefit themselves and not the planner class, but now they at least have rhetorical cover 
for those actions. And that, for me, is the tide of Republican ideology and Morgan coming out of Bacon's Rebellion and acts as a springboard for him to go into his his uh, discussion about the relationship between Bacon's Rebellion and these developments in its aftermath and the American Revolution a century later. So this. I think there's there's two parts to that that I want to to pick up on. Um, the first of which is sort of that entrenchment of slavery within Virginia, and the second of which is the tie that you're talking about, where Morgan is essentially arguing that you do not get American freedom in a Virginian sense without it being inextricably tied to the existence of and the entrenchment of American slavery, and. This is where I find the book almost totally unconvincing. And I realise that it's not the... Um, I'm not the first person to say this. And as, as you say, Roy, there have there's been many people that have tried to reinterpret this and no one has yet succeeded in, in knocking Morgan off its um, pedestal in terms of, of early American history. But it seems to me that what he talks about with this decision to to move towards slavery doesn't have that same sensitivity to the source base that we've talked about in all the previous um, sections of the book. That in everything else there's been such a careful linking of events to changes in ideology, um, to the progression of unintended consequences and so on, that that story up to Bacon's Rebellion flows really, really nicely. But then this idea of the creation of separate legal statuses, it's not quite clear why it happens in the way that it does, how people allow it to happen in the way that it does. I think of this particularly because it's not at all clear from the process of Bacon's Rebellion, that the planter elite will be able to define themselves as operating in the public good because the Republican ideology of Bacon's declaration in the name of the people and other petitions that are written at the time is so strongly infused with Republican ideology, but a Republican ideology that casts the the planter elite as the bad guys. And I'm not sure that that shift that goes completely 180 degrees in a generation is sufficiently tied back to Bacon's Rebellion in the way that, that Morgan presents it. There seems to be a, a change in the, in the way that the book is written at that point that leads to a lot of these ideas being used in somewhat more slippery or certainly less concrete ways than they have been in the previous sections of the book. And I think that ties into what I would say about the the second part of the argument, you know, this, this tie between freedom and slavery. It suggests that within a very short period of time, there's a conscious choice that pretty much unites the entirety of Virginian society, or at least white Virginian society, in a very short space of time, when the story of the previous... 80 years has been that basically no one can get over their ties of self-interest. And he doesn't explain why that would change quite so quickly either. It seems there that there's an awful lot that is, that is missing for him to prove the case that he wants to make in the, in the fourth part of the book. Yeah, I think the book does change in that last section. For the first three books, it's largely chronological and narrative and then you get to this fourth section and it's basically a collection of four essays mm -hmm. written in an essayistic manner mm -hmm. so the book definitely changes but I, I think it does that in part because the scope of what morgan wants to talk about after telling us the story of the first 80 years of virginia history in three sections uh is uh to cover the the next hundred years in one section or less than 100 pages. I mean, in some sense, that last section should be its own book. And other scholars have tried to fill in that gap. The problem is that, you know, if you're looking for the book to address directly the question posed in the title, it's in this last section where I agree with Ken. It becomes, if not the least convincing, certainly the least satisfying part of the book from a strictly historical perspective. 
It's very interesting that the two of you uh, are, are taking such a, a harsh uh, assessment of, uh, of of the final section of Morgan's book because I, I agree with you in some ways. I think as a social history, as a as a history that has its fingers on the pulse of the ground of what's going on in colonial Virginia, I do think you are both right that in the, the final section. American slavery, American freedom begins to fall apart. It begins to sort of fail as a social history. But as a political and intellectual history, I think it becomes a stronger and stronger book as it picks up steam in this final section. Because I think what Morgan does here and why I think it's possible for there to be a sort of reconciliation between sort of Baconites, if you want to use that term, and Berkeleyites what makes slavery so successful in Virginia is it solves so many problems that are political problems for both Berkeleyites and for Baconites, for both poorer whites and for both planter elite. It, it solves the Republican riddle. It cuts the Gordian knot. It, by, As Michael said, by putting a class of people permanently outside of the body of politics and saying this is where a majority of our labor is going to come from. We no longer have to worry about a disenfranchised part of the body politic coming up and ending our virtuous republic by pushing its economic needs upon us all. And at the same time, it speaks to the, po- the social and economic and political needs of poor whites because slavery, at least nominally, provides a, po- a, a path to upward mobility that had been falling away in the middle decades of the 17th century, where s- o- 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 slavery, by owning African Americans and exploiting their labor, provides a way of moving at least nominally towards planter status. That's going to remain unaccessible to an overwhelming majority of of white Virginians, but it's still going to be there. It's still going to be the Virginian dream well into the 19th century, well, you know, up to the Civil War. And it, 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 it cuts this Gordian knot in a way that is going to make the American Revolution possible. Without slavery, there could not be an American Revolution. And later scholarship, Timothy Breen, and others are going to come down and say the same thing, that the idea of solving the labor problem in Virginia through slavery and creating some sense of social stability by the middle decades of the 18th century is the only way that the planner elite is going to be willing to become basically forced founders, to use Woody Holton's term, in the later decades of the 18th century. At the same time that you say all of this, one of the things that I find most annoying about that argument is that the entirety of Morgan's evidence up to this point has been plans don't work, ideology doesn't work. There is a way that these things play out on the ground that causes significantly greater problems than anyone can foresee. And the way that he presents this solution as being found is just so convenient at the end of the book at at the end of a book which has built all of its most substantial and compelling arguments on the idea that history is not convenient that history that sort of willfully goes looking for things that complicate its arguments and then at the end tries to tie them in this knot that is very convenient and fits everything together just far too nicely. If ideological concerns could have been that easily implemented to sort things out in Virginia, A, why don't they happen before Bacon's Rebellion? B, why does it take in some ways 30 years after Bacon's Rebellion for them to become quite so established as solutions within Virginian society? 
I agree that there is something that is elegant about that argument and that a lot of the weaknesses of this, the argument that I've been pushing at here are simultaneously weaknesses of every other interpretation that has been offered for the consolidation of slavery in Virginia in the same period. But it seems to me perverse to celebrate a book for its sensitivity to the relationship between social structure and labour and ideology for three quarters of the book. And then when it pretty much dumps the social and the labour sensitivity for ideology at the end of it, suddenly to say, well, this makes an awful lot of sense in the way everything fits together. Ouch. It is, it is a little bit harsh. I, I, I accept that. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think it's a little bit harsh, but but I think in the section on the revolution toward the republic, I, I think he's actually doing something you were praising him for earlier, which is uh, his awareness of the importance of unintended consequences. When whites were separated from black slaves, it created a white class besides the elites that was no longer helpless and would not stand for being exploited in the ways in which they had before. And in that sense, Bacon's Rebellion was a sort of harbinger of the revolution. For elites, Bacon's Rebellion reinforced a long-standing distrust of a poor class and its potential for disorder and disruption. Um, Republicanism required independent individuals, right? Those who worked for wages, whether they're landless whites in the South uh, or manufactory laborers, wage laborers in the North, uh, could not be independent and therefore, in great numbers, posed a threat to the social and political order and stability. I think in part social mobility or the the pretense of social mobility, uh, in addition to other factors that subsequent historians have have talked about, like patriarchy and things like that, I think that kept class relations relatively stable by rendering the, the lower orders, in a sense, politically docile. But when the imperial reforms came in the 1760s, Planner elites had no other choice but to enlist uh, this class of poor whites in the revolutionary cause and, and to, in a sense, politically activate them in a way and on a scale that they hadn't been since Bacon's Rebellion 90 years earlier. And I think that's the unintended consequences angle he was trying to get at and, and which you were praising him for earlier. And, and at the very least, the arguments does explain the neutralization of class as a political weapon in Virginia for much of the next hundred years. And I think that that is, a, that is an astute observation of Virginian politics, that we see many more class tensions in much more equal colonial societies than you'd find in Virginia. Um, if there's one quibble I have with the way that you and Roy have presented it, I'm not sure that it's necessarily that there's social mobility. It's just that, um, or, or rather, there is a relative social mobility because you basically bring in 30 to 40 percent of the population to be beneath the people that were previously at the bottom of the population. Yeah, I, I don't think that there's, that there's necessarily any um, relative improvement between those at the bottom of the Virginian social scale and the top of the Virginian social scale in the 18th century from a white perspective. Um, there is, if you're looking at that from... Um, from the perspective of an enslaved African within Virginian society. Yeah, well, uh, it's a negative form of positive mobility, certainly, but, but the purpose of it is, as you said, the neutralization of class division. And when you get to the 1760s, planners have to risk reigniting those class divisions by enlisting non-elites in, in the resistance and subsequently revolutionary cause. And that uh, as well as what we've seen in work done by historians more recently on Virginia uh, in this period, like Woody Holton, uh, is, I think, part of the narrative of unintended consequences. Mm-hmm. Although I would argue that neutralizing class is something that is a little bit different from building a culture of freedom on a culture of slavery. Did you want to say anything on that, Roy? I did. The problem, and I think it's something you identified earlier, Ken and Michael. The problem isn't so much saying Bacon's Rebellion is important to this. It's that the way in which he abandons narrative in this final final 
section of the book makes the argument much more open to attack than if he had, say, extended the book by another 50 or 100 pages and really dug in that it is a it is a longer process that gets accelerated with broader imperial reforms in a, in the 1680s with and the early 1690s with the glorious revolution that there is a self-conscious effort to create institutional depth in Virginia that is much, much more successful than previous attempts. And a lot of that has to do with these previous attempts have clear support from London. And it's and the future scholarship or scholarship that's published, you know, after the nineteen seventies really makes this clear that it, it, it isn't just Bacon's Rebellion. Bacon's Rebellion is a really important wake up call, but it, it is a longer process that isn't really firmly in place until the eighteenth century, until the seventeen tens or seventeen twenties in Virginia. And it's not so much that class struggle goes away in Virginia. I mean anyone who looks at the revolution in Virginia, the American Revolution in Virginia. No, I mean it's clear that that, that class struggle among whites is, is is there. It's that slavery provides a really important buffer. So slavery solves a lot of problems that really doesn't become clear or crystallized or permanent until the early 18th century. In a way that isn't really clear because of the collapsing chronology in this final part of Morgan's book. I mean, Ken's point is well taken, right? The last section does tie a pretty neat bow on the class situation in Virginia at the end of the 18th century. Obviously, there's much more work to be done there by the planners in locking themselves in as the unquestionable dominant social and economic class and in consolidating the, the, the hierarchical and patriarchal uh, society that is Virginia by the eve of the revolution. And that's a story that's going to uh, play out through the first half of the 18th century. And as you get into the middle of the 18th century, and certainly by the 1760s, I mean, you can even begin to see republicanism itself uh, increasingly problematizing slavery. And so, I mean, I can see Ken's qualms about the last section uh, as being legitimate. Well, thank you for supporting me, Michael. That's incredibly gracious. Yeah, don't get used to it. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I know what a strain that was for you. <laughs> With all that we've we've said there, exploring the the last part of of Morgan's book, I think one thing that we can unquestionably say about the quality of Morgan's work, and a testament to how provocative and how interesting the argument is, is how many works have basically taken revising some part of Morgan as their starting point. And there's been a, a host of books um, by or articles, um, Kathleen Brown, Anthony Parent, um, some of the um, edited collection edited by Doug Bradburn and John Coombs. I mean, there's been a huge amount of work that has been done um, reconsidering colonial Virginia reconsidering Bacon's Rebellion. Given that we have identified that there are at least grounds for such criticism of Morgan within the last book, why is it that this work has still managed to maintain such a fantastically strong reputation amongst historians and early American historians who, let's face it, as a group, are notoriously difficult to please. To be brutally honest, Ken, uh, the reason why it's been so successful is, is that's correct. Uh, race and freedom in the United States are intimately linked, and that story has really important origins in the ordeal of colonial Virginia. And this is something that revisionists of Morgan agree with him on. And that and the fact that Morgan has produced, a, or Morgan produced a book that is a relatively concise, highly articulate easy to digest take on this ordeal is why it remains so influential. It's such a great base from which a variety of other interpretations can work from and it has that great 
benefit of being largely correct. Anyone who looks at the 21st century United States and this world of Ferguson and a variety of other racial conflicts that we have has to see that freedom and race remain linked in the 21st century and this has origins and it has origins again in colonial Virginia. Right. I have to agree with Warrior. I think a lot of its remarkable staying power has to do uh, partly with, this, with the same reason that it's so persuasive 40 years later. I mean, even for those who approach it highly skeptically, uh, I think it, it remains really plausible, even in light of all the scholarship that has been done since uh, in the last 40 years on colonial Virginia uh, and on the relationships there between politics, culture, race, gender, and religion. None of it really is outright debunked, Morgan, as it were, but instead, I think the best of that work builds on the understanding first laid out by Morgan in 1975 in American Slavery, American Freedom. And I think part of its staying power also has to do with Morgan's uh, really accessible writing style. This is that rare kind of book that has engaged an entire field of historians, multiple generations of historians, while at the same time can be fruitfully read and enjoyed by non-academic readers. And finally, there's just the sheer richness of Morgan's account. I mean, there is so much more to this book than we've discussed here today. I mean, I'm sure uh, we've left out a good number of things that other historians would say, how could you possibly talk about this book and not mention this or, or that? And, and they're right. But we're, we're constrained by time, and Morgan's account is just so rich and, and so deep in the amount of things that he covers and explores that it'd just really be impossible to cover all or even most of it uh, in a single hour-long discussion. I agree with what most of both of you have said in terms of why it has such longevity. I think another reason is the fact that it's written from an outsider's perspective. That, as we said at the start of the podcast, Morgan wasn't a historian of colonial Virginia before he wrote this book. And I think that that lack of direct investment in a lot of the specific debates means that he's able to craft a lot of those smaller stories into a larger narrative. I mean, it still is a very Ed Morgan book. It still has a lot of those focuses on ideology. It has those periods where it moves between social structure and ideas, um, sometimes very well, sometimes in a slightly less concrete way. It's very much a book that's written by Ed Morgan, but the fact that he's writing this from outside the field and coming into it, I think really helps some of the richness. Um, and I would also pick up on your point, Michael, how much this book mentions. Um, when I was rereading this, I was expecting that there would be certain things that seemed really dated. Because it's difficult for a book that's dealing especially with issues of race, um, slavery, and contact with Native Americans to not be outdated after several decades of scholarship um, on such a topic. And yet, whenever I was thinking about how does this topic fit into early Virginia, within a few pages, it came up within the book. It, it, it's extraordinarily good at weaving together a range of causes in a way that doesn't take such a sharp approach on any one of those causes that the methodology seems particularly dated. And that's an enormous strength that I think, although I would praise many of the books that have been written on early Virginia that have taken their lead from Morgan, in some ways it's incredibly difficult to take on Morgan because he mentions so much that any alternative interpretation is necessarily going to pick up on one or two of those strands. And therefore, in a historical profession that really does value the explication of complexity within its historical works, it's very difficult to write a revision of Morgan that seems more complex in interlinking causes rather than hitting one or two of those causes particularly hard. And that has helped its staying power within the field as well. Well, it's been a pleasure to talk about such an interesting book by such an 
eminent and commendable historian um, at such great length. But I think that does bring us to the end of our time discussing American slavery, American freedom today. We will, of course, be putting up a list of further reading about the issues that we've raised in our discussion today up on our website. Um, So please do go and check that out if you would like some further suggestions for putting Morgan's work within a larger context. Um, As ever, we would love to know what you make of the podcast um, and what you thought of this episode, and there are many ways that you can get in contact with us. First of all, you can visit our new website, www.thejontocast.com. You can also find us on our Facebook page, which is at facebook.com slash thejuntocast, and you can leave us a comment there. Or you can find us on Twitter using the handle at Juntocast. And please do search for us on iTunes under the Juntocast, where you can leave us a rating and a review, and that will help us find new listeners. You can always email us at thejuntoblog at gmail.com. We all blog at the Junto, which you can find at earlyamericanists.com, and you can keep up to date with general Junto updates on Twitter using the handle at the Junto blog. So, that means it's time for me to thank Michael Hatton. Thank you, Ken. And thank Roy Rogers. Thanks, Ken. And to thank you all for listening to this episode of the Junto Cast. We hope you'll join us for the next episode. <laughs>